to RPTV Weekly News Show. My name is Fred and my co-hosts are Kidar and Gabriel. We present news that impacts on Regent Park and the surrounding areas. In this episode, we present the following news for the week of January 16th to February 24th. Safety Network and Toronto Police celebrates quarterly community meeting. Fred Victor celebrates Lunar New Year 2024. Neighborhood Information Post hosts Moss Park Photo Story event at Rosedale Heights School of the Arts. Nelson Mandela Park receives 170 musical instruments from Jazz FM. City of Toronto approves 2024 budget. Events and jobs in Regent Park. Regent Park Safety Network and Toronto Police celebrate remarkable community milestones in Regent Park. The Regent Park Social Development Safety Network and Toronto Police Services recently came together to commemorate their quarterly community meeting, a meaningful occasion celebrating the collective efforts towards enhancing the safety and well-being of Regent Park residents. In attendance were representatives from Toronto Police Services, community leaders, and numerous Regent Park residents. Held at 150 River Street, the event served as an opportunity for reflection on the journey towards fostering a secure and vibrant environment in Regent Park. Highlighting the significant steps made, Toronto Police officers presented the Crime Stats Report from Toronto Police Services 51 Division, revealing a remarkable decrease in major crime indicators throughout the year of 2023. Of particular significance was the achievement of zero gun related deaths in Regent Park during this period. Uh, it's a celebration today because we want to acknowledge as a community that our neighborhood is becoming safer, right? All major crime indicators are on a downward trend. That is amazing. The fact that we had zero gun-related deaths in 2023 is something we should all be proud of. Esteemed guests, including Councillor Chris Moyes and MPP Kristen Walmtam, offered short remarks underscoring the significance of community collaboration in fostering a safe and inclusive environment. Here it is a celebration. Uh, zero gun deaths is a milestone. It's something we should be all very proud of. And we didn't get here by chance. So there's been a lot of investments in our community over the years. Uh, and the city has had a, a, a large part to play with that. But the Regent Park Safety Network, for example, some folks are here today. I've worked very closely with the, uh, the school boards, the various schools in this neighborhood. Uh, the neighborhood officers who are here today have had a huge part to play in that. Um, and even you know, in my own office, constituent office here in Regent Park, I know we've seen about maybe two to 3,000 people so far uh, in the last 12 or so months we've been there. So all hands on deck, it does take a village to actually uh, get to this point. And we must continue to invest in our communities. I wanna just to lend my own voice to say thank you to the hard work of the men and women in uniform of 51 Division. Uh, this, I've said it before on numerous occasions, 51 Division is the hardest working division across the city. They're also the busiest division, despite the fact that we are the tiniest little geography Toronto Center. Uh, and if they're the busiest division in Toronto, you know that means that they're the busiest division in the entire country. So if I can just get you to give them a round of applause again, thank you. <laughs> Nigel, thank you for your presentation. Um, I was really quite remarked and moved when you were talking about the last homicide that we had experienced in Regent Park. And I think you will all, um, I'm, I'm just gonna take a moment to just reflect. September the 18th, 2021, uh, we lost a, a, a remarkable young man in our community. A member of the City of Toronto, Toronto Public Service, Thane Murray, he was a recreation youth worker. Many of you know Thane, many of your kids or grandkids knew Thane and losing him was a significant blow to our community, one that I know that we still feel deeply today. It's also with a little bit of joy knowing that that's the last time that we have lost a member of our community. 
despite that very significant loss. So there are some things that are happening right now in Regent Park that we gotta keep going. Because we like that statistic of zero. And I know that for the families in our community that have mourned the loss of those who have fallen to violence, and especially gun violence, it is a, a, a gut punch when that happens. So I know that there have been too many funerals, too many memorials, and today as we commemorate the things that we have gone through as a community, this is a very important milestone, which is why Brother Walid has brought us here with all the, the supporters of the RPNA to specifically reflect upon what have we done. What have we seen in Regent Park over the past little while? We've seen investments come in, sizable investments, but not just in the brick and mortar, because we talked about that as a community on numerous occasions, is that we cannot invest only in the real estate. We have to invest deeply and thoughtfully, purposefully in our people. And we have to get to the root causes of violence, which means we address poverty and inequity. And so, <laughs> thank you, well, no, thank you, Miguel. Um, and that is something that requires government action. And so we know that we have a responsibility. The councillor and I have had numerous conversations of how do we continue to support this remarkable neighborhood together, him at City Hall, myself at Queens Park. And that is through investments to make sure that there are opportunities for education, kids can stay in school, our community is invested in with recreation and cultural programs and that money has to flow not just for the real estate but also for the people. So there are budgets, budgets that are passed all the time. Budgets that are a reflection of the values of who we are and what we stand for. And so we know that the City of Toronto is making significant investments in community safety and my hat tip to the councillor and everybody who's been involved with those budget consultations and those deliberations Next year, the Social Development Fund, which is a sizable amount of money that's just specifically targeted for this community to allow the community to do the work that they want done for themselves is coming up for renewal. There will be a lot of activity, including all of you having to step forward to make sure that that pot of money is not just renewed, which it should be, but also increased because we've seen significant, significant results that are all very positive. So that is a body of work that you have to do. And I'm gonna do that with you, with the counselor, and with our PNA, because that's important. And then finally, yeah, yeah, let's do it. And then finally, there's one other thing. <clears throat> there's money at Queen's Park. There's a lot of money at Queen's Park, and don't you let the Premier tell you that there isn't any money. Because there are billions of dollars in unallocated funds. They're not just, pots, there's not, it's not surplus. They're just sitting in accounts. We need to make sure that Queen's Park also is investing in Regent Park. So we have three orders of government working together to uplift 69 acres of downtown, um, uh, in a downtown neighborhood, one of the most dynamic, exciting neighborhoods in Toronto. And that is something that I pledge that I will do with you, and I want to make sure that you have a voice at Queen's Park as well. Throughout the event, voices from the community resonated during the resident reflection segment, offering first-hand perspectives and experiences. When I came to Regent Park in 2011, I was used to hear about funerals, about vigils, I was, every, almost every year, we were losing members of our community. The investments that we're making in this community are resulting in positive outcomes. I want to make um, a side note. Um, Chair Morgan of the Toronto Police Services Board in November asked me a question. Miguel, if we need to remove anything from the line of the budget, what would you do? What would you like to see happen to stay or to be removed? 
and the answer is like Chris. Do not remove the neighborhood community officers. And that was because I understand the dynamic, the conversations, the good dialogue that we're having in this community with the neighborhood community officers. We need to learn from our success as much as our failure. So why did we succeed? Well, this is something that we, it's like we, everybody here is left to figure out, to guess why we succeeded. The numbers are falling. And so we, after the presentation by the police officers, Christine came up and said, we need more funding. So it, it, it natural, we have to fill the gap. Does, does it mean more money means more success? But we, we still need to know why. Is it because the criminals went away from Regent Park up and elsewhere? Or is it something fundamentally we're doing something right that we have, we have a, you know, addressed the root causes of crime? So I think next time we want to know why too. The culmination of the celebration was marked by a symbolic cake cutting ceremony, symbolizing the shared commitment and achievements of the community. Fred Victor celebrates Lunar New Year 2024. Fred Victor, a prominent leader in combat and homelessness in Toronto, joined hands with the Region Park community to celebrate Lunar New Year 2024 at the 40 Old Community Center on February 13th. The vibrant event brought together individuals from diverse backgrounds to mark the occasion. Attendees immerse themselves in activities including traditional dumpling making, savoring traditional snacks, board games, and enjoy a lively dancing session with the local Chinese dancers. The atmosphere was filled with joy and togetherness as community members bonded over shared traditions and cultural experiences. <laughs> to honor the Year of the Dragon, according to the Chinese zodiac, guests were encouraged to wear the color red symbolizing good fortune and prosperity. RPTV reporters Gabriel Meisner and Dmitry Martinovich were present at the event to interview community members to capture the essence of the festivity and the importance of fostering community connections. Hello, my name is Gabriel Meisner and you're watching RPTV News. What is your name? Ashrafi Ahmed. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. And what is this event that we're at today? So today is called the Lunar New Year. This is our uh, traditionally in Regent Park uh, uh, Chinese community. They celebrate every year. So they are our gardener, they are our community members and our residents. So we always love to share with them the new beginning. Very nice. And um, why do you think uh, an event like this is important to the community? Uh, it's very important because the community always uh, love to share their culture. So Lunar New Year is like one of the cultural uh, events. It's called the New Year for uh, Chinese community. And we also find out this is only not Lunar New Year for Chinese community, also Vietnamese uh, community and other, like Tibetan community, they all celebrate the same time, the Lunar New Year. And the thing is like a Lunar New Year is depending on the moon. So every year you can see is the date is not the same day, it's changing. And we invite Chinese uh, senior dance group so they always coming and uh, love to show their culture. And I love their culture outfit, their tradition thing. Uh, even we can't understand all the thing, but we have one volunteer who always helping us to understand their culture. So this is really great way to learning and adopt that culture and celebrating at Fred Victor Center. Is that volunteer Linda? Yeah, right. well, Linda is one of our garden volunteer. Yeah. Is there anything else you want to add? Um, I really like thank you to RPTV to come and covering and we love to see you in future event too and one of our big event also is called the Bengali Tamil New Year and it's celebration in April so hopefully see you guys there. What is your name? My name is Linda. Nice to meet you.
Um, how long have you worked here? Oh, it's, it's, I'm just a volunteer here. I think it's over three or four or five years. I, I, actually, I never count because I'm living in this neighborhood over 15 years. Yeah. And uh, what do you do here? Here today, we are working as a volunteer to celebrate the Nuna New Year. And my job is working for a legal firm. It's GoLink Legal Services and helping the neighborhood. Today is Chinese Nuna New Year. So we get all the people get together and we make the dumplings by ourselves. And we have the Chinese dancing groups. They are also volunteers to contribute their time and the dancing and to have fun, to have a happy new year and wish everything goes good in the new year and happy and lucky to be strong and wealth, to be rich, whatever, to be happy. <laughs> yeah. And um, what are some of the traditions that are usually done on Chinese New Year's? Oh, Chinese New Year? Okay, I have a good sample here, the envelope. The red envelope is always the adult one give to the children with the dependents. So wish them good luck and a good year. And also another tradition is the f families get together and have lots of food, very delicious food. And they've got every, all the people, people uh, all the families, no matter how far away they will get together and to enjoy and celebrate with new clothes, the new dress for a new, a brand new year again. Oh, I think it's very good for this community because this community is a diversity. So get all the t people to get together and know each other's culture and to respect everyone. And it's just like Christmas. Christmas we also celebrate and uh, for care of each other and to have a good wish. Especially currently, I think it's all the economic is not as good as before maybe. I'm not very sure about that, but I know everyone wants a new wish. So even if it's Chinese noon and New Year, not many Chinese here, and all the Chinese are the volunteers to, to spread this kind of love and care, to let them know that Chinese people are also happy and I wish everyone a happy New Year and to take care of each other when they lead it. That's very nice. Um, what were some of the dances that were here? Oh, yeah, the, the, uh, this is a happy group dance. They are all the senior people, some are over even 70. But they, yeah, they dance for over 10 years. Yeah, they dance everywhere, yeah, anytime. And when the people call them, they just go there for free and donate. Of course, there was some donation for them to run this non-profit uh, organization as well. But they truly love to dance. They love to dance and also they like to show the people the pretty as well. And also the culture. I think it's mainly for the culture, to sp spread over the culture as well. Neighborhood Information Post hosts Moss Park Photo Story event at Rosedale Heights School of the Arts. Neighborhood Information Post, a cornerstone community service provider in Regent Park and surrounding areas, recently hosted the Moss Park Photo Story event at Rosedale Heights School of the Arts. The event, graced by the presence of Councillor Chris Moyes and MPP Kristen Walmtam, showcased the talent and creativity of the Moss Park community's children and youth. The Moss Park Photo Story Project is a transformative initiative aimed at empowering children and youth through art. Through the lens of photography, participants express themselves, share their stories, and connect with their community in meaningful ways. Attendees at the event were treated to a captivating journey through an array of photographs, 
each telling a unique story of life, resilience, and hope in Moss Park. From vibrant street scenes to intimate portraits, the exhibit offered a glimpse into the rich experiences within the community. Through art, the Moss Park Photo Story event fostered connections, amplified voices, and celebrated the beauty and resilience of the community. Neighborhood Information Post continues to be a driving force in nurturing creativity, fostering community engagement, and empowering the next generation of artists and storytellers in Region Park, Moss Park, and beyond. RPTV reporter Dimitri was at the event to interview community members. Let's hear what they have to say. My name is Michelle Forrester, and I'm a board member with Neighborhood Information Post. It's a project that we're very proud of. Um, it gives the youth a great sense of pride and ownership, and to see their images um, displayed in such a wonderful book, um, it's, it's just um, words cannot express um, the great sense of pride, as Vishnu said, that it, it gives the youth and um, <clears throat> also it, it also uh, shows great talent that they probably didn't tap into prior to this project. So we're very proud of it. Um, it's a great success. The book looks wonderful and we're really happy to put it on display today. Oh, my experience, um, basically uh, we took a lot of photos of Moss Park and the true beauty is that not only did we get to collab with each other, but we got to show the true beauty of what our community is. I think we all bonded well, just having the camera, having different settings with the camera, and just taking as much pictures as we like to, see what everyone would like, and I just thought it was fun. Yeah, it was a great experience where I definitely, uh, I definitely uh, learned how to hone my photography skills. And uh, even though I came in a bit late, it's still like, a surreal feeling having you know, my work featured in a physical copy of a real book. To pick up and increase our photography skills, uh, not only that, but we were able to take pictures of our local community where we've been growing up and also do it alongside some uh, friends and uh, uh, local, uh, local citizens. My name is Brian Gregory. I am the program lead for the Moss Park Photography Project. Um, I essentially uh, helped lead the, uh, the youth in this program uh, from start to finish. Uh, we taught them a lot about the fundamentals of photography and moved on into how to use a camera and essentially guided them through the entire process of um, starting from understanding, you know, the, like I said, the fundamentals to understanding how to operate a camera and how to uh, use the equipment and um, essentially uh, become a professional photographer. My background, uh, I have worked in film and photography for the past 15 years. Um, I, sorry, just give me one moment, just catch myself. Um, so I've worked in film and photography for 15 years. I have um, traveled the world uh, from almost every single continent. I've been fortunate enough, uh, I've studied at York University, George Brown College, New York Film Academy, and um, I've, I've worked several internships that have had me travel around the world. I've been very fortunate, and uh, it's afforded me a lot of life experience um, to be able to understand how people live all over the world. And it's, um, it's a constant um, curiosity of mine to understand human beings, uh, understand people's experiences, uh, from all different walks of life, and um, this was no, this project was no different. Uh, getting to know the youth of Moss Park, um, some of the obstacles that they face, uh, the hurdles that they have to overcome, uh, just to show up and 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 be present. Um, it was really, really, uh, it was really beneficial for me to uh, get to know the youth and to just understand where they're coming from. Working with the youth of Moss Park presented some challenges but also uh, created opportunity for a lot of uh, progression to be made. Now when we were working with these kids um, they were fresh slates. They, they didn't know anything about photography. They didn't necessarily know how to use a camera and um, they didn't um, you know, know any of the fundamentals or anything like that. But what they all did have in common is they had access to a smart camera, a smartphone, uh, a tablet, anything that can take a photo. 
So we use that as a common ground to um, bring the kids into the craft and teach them uh, a lot of the fundamentals. So some of the first exercises that we did were shot on their cell phones. Um, a lot of, of um, kids were, were young, some were as, as, as young as six years old. And we, you know, if they have a parent that has a smartphone, anything like that, as long as they could get their hands on some camera, the idea was to teach them that it doesn't matter what you're using, uh, it matters how you use it. And so uh, we taught them a lot of lighting, composition, framing, um, different techniques that could be executed with household materials, lights that you have around your house, uh, you know, in your buildings, in your neighborhood, and really motivated them to work with what they have and try to make the most of that. Now, once we moved on from those lessons, we moved up to teaching them how to use a real camera. And the beautiful part about this program is that we were able to fund and put multiple camera kits in the community for the youth um, that's accessible for them to use up until this day. Um, so these cameras were not, did not uh, disappear with the program. Um, they are in the community permanently and available to the youth of the program. So it's something that I really motivated them and really encouraged them to do, which was to make use of the cameras, experiment, go out, play with it, uh, make mistakes, just learn. And um, it was a beautiful thing that the youth, they were very uh, open to trying something new, to uh, learning a new craft, to just stepping outside of their comfort zone and pushing their boundaries. And I think all the, the youth involved really did that. They really embraced the craft. They really uh, took it in with respect and treated it as if they're, as their own. And um, it was a really beautiful thing and, and very um, full circle for me to be able to be a part of this and guide them through that process. Um, it, it really, I, I really got a lot from, from guiding them through that. And um, the biggest thing I would say was the youth, they were very quick to learn and to get up to speed. You know, the, the youth today with technology, it's, it's a very different world. And um, just being able to get around and understand the craft in, in such a quick way, I was really impressed with how they were able to take what I would consider obstacles and hurdles and be able to overcome them very quickly and, uh, with amazing resilience. So the book came about as we sifted through the hundreds and thousands of photos that were taken by the youth, uh, we began a very tedious process of selecting the best of the best photos. Um, this was something that took multiple rounds. It took um, a lot of um, involvement and um, a lot of uh, meetings with the staff where we went over some of the best work that each participant had submitted. And um, we really just took our time to choose the best of the best and find photography that really um, spoke to the community, that really uh, emphasizes what the community stands for. And um, I think we, we did a great job in, in selecting photos um, that really represent the true essence and feeling and community that Moss Park truly is. So my name is Deborah Williams and I'm actually the school board trustee for Toronto District School Board uh, and uh, I represent uh, two city wards, University Rosedale where this school is located and Toronto Centre. The collaboration that's represented by this exhibit stems from an initiative uh, of the school improvement plan for Rosedale Heights. Some of the goals that were set um, by the school and the students to really engage community. The collaboration that's represented by this exhibition really shines a light on our collective commitment to equity and building partnerships within a greater community. So as many of you might know, at the Toronto District School Board in February, we celebrate Black History Month. And this year's theme uh, in for Black History Month at Toronto in February is Our Black Is. And I just want to 
acknowledge and appreciate some of the brilliance that's come out showing what our black is. I can see it here in the artwork that's displayed. I can see it here in the faces of the students and the community members. You know, you've heard young, gifted, and black. It's really represented here in the amazing artwork and, and the voice that that artwork represents uh, in, in, in the creative expression that's been um, displayed here. And my heart is really filled with gratitude and appreciation for being invited to share this moment this evening with you. And I just want to thank you for that. Nelson Mandela Park receives 170 musical instruments from Jazz FM 91. More than 170 musical instruments donated by Jazz FM 91 listeners have found a new home at Nelson Mandela Park Public School, Regent Park. The delivery wrapped up the 11th year of Jazz FM 91's award-winning Holiday Heroes Instrument Drive. Operated in partnership with Lone and McQuaid and FedEx Canada. When the instruments came into the building, the kids were so excited. You could see the spark in their eyes, said Sudeep Sanjal, principal of Nelson Mandela Park. The 170 instruments donated to Nelson Mandela Park Public School included guitars, keyboards, brass, woodwinds, drum kits, and more. City of Toronto approves 2024 budget. On February 14, 2023, Mayor Olivia Chow presented the city's 2024 budget, marking her first financial plan as mayor. The budget includes a significant 9.5 residential property tax hike citywide, the highest since Toronto's amalgamation in 1998, alongside a $20 million increase to the police budget. The decision to grant the full budget increase to the Toronto Police Service came after a series of debates and demonstrations, with the council ultimately approving 20 million requests. The budget developed with input from over 50,000 residents emphasizes core services and investments in key areas, including affordable housing, transit, and community safety. As we mark Budget Day, we are charting a path towards building a city that's more caring. When I became mayor last year, I heard the cries of Andrea Magalies. And she said she hopes officials can hear the pain in her voice. And she wants them to imagine it is your child that could be murdered on a subway. When they're making decisions about whether public service deserves funding. She wants us to remember that. We need more social services, she said. We need more investment into physical and mental health. We need more support for housing, said the mom who experienced horrible, unbearable pain. Well, today, Andrea, this city official, this mayor hurt you. My budget delivers a city that is there for people when times are tough. A city when reliable, uh, with reliable, affordable, and safe transit. Where you can find an affordable place to live. Where people aren't left out in the cold on the street. It is important because people need to feel safe in your neighborhood and on transit. This budget is how we get our city back on track, even though I inherited a huge 1.8 billion shortfall. Over the last few months, when I was listening to tens of thousands of people at local meetings and in deputations in telephone town halls, I thought of how in the worst period of her life, Andrea McLeese received so much love. She said this community is just amazing. And she urged people to raise their voices so they can be heard. And this is what she said. More needs to be done to help people in crisis. More needs to be done so that people don't get to, to the point where they are in crisis, she said. Well, Torontonians heard her call. 
when asked, thousands of Torontonians said they wanted us to take better care of each other by investing in housing, transit, public safety, and neighborhoods. This budget helps build new rental housing where 24,000 families will find new homes. And just this year, we will have thousands of Torontonians that will find affordable homes so they don't have to make the choice of skipping meals or turning off the heat or just paying rent. We're building more affordable housing and building them faster. This budget protects renters who are feeling anxious about evictions, demo evictions, and high rent increases by investing in programs that help people stay in their homes. And for those who find themselves on the street, Toronto will provide more funding for food, health care, laundry, dignity. These will be available at 22 drop-in centers across the city on top of additional funding for more shelters and warming centers. For those experiencing crisis, we will try to catch them while they fall and help them get back on their feet. That's why we're investing in mental health support through the expansion of the 24-7 Toronto Community Crisis Services. This budget invests in millions of children and young people, giving them strength and hope. 200,000 kids will grow up stronger because of nutritious food in schools, especially at a time when family food budgets are getting squeezed by rising food prices. Thousands of young people would excel in sports, arts, and culture, learning leadership skills, finding themselves and developing deep friendship through youth hubs in libraries, community centers, and other public spaces. We are building stronger neighborhoods by investing in grants in youth programs and local neighborhood organizations. Scarborough Transit Riders will save 20 minutes a day when we finish building the busway along the Scarborough RT. All riders will see TDC service improve, but will not have to pay more. We're taking a holistic approach to safety. We're hiring over 160 highly visible TDC workers, so there are better customer services and more eyes and years at subway stations. We have 40 new traffic agents, so drivers, cyclists, and pedestrians obey the law, and TDC riders get a smoother and faster commute. We're sending the right people to the right cause when crisis line, with our crisis line, while also funding hundreds of more firefighters, ambulances, and paramedics, and police officers. We're getting the basics back on track through a new 50 million back on track fund for urgent state of good repair, like fixing potholes, beautifying our parks and public spaces across the city over the next two years. We're able to do all this investment because all levels of government are listening to Andrea's call for better funding to public services. The provincial government stepped up through the New Deal for Toronto, uploading the Gardner and the DVP, and provided funding for shelter, housing, transit, and more. The federal government stepped up big time for our city to help us build more housing and sheltering refugees. Yes, we inherited a $1.8 billion budget hole created by the cost of the pandemic and the past financial strategy that didn't make hard choices. But we're fixing the mess. And we are building the budget while we're doing it. We found over half a billion dollars in savings for a diligent line-by-line -line review. Andrea told us that she did not want things to go the way they were going. So we are getting our city back on track after years of decline. Even with all our hard work, we still needed to increase revenue so vital city services will improve. 
So homeowners will have to pay less than $1 a day. Renters will not have to do so because we are lowering the multi-residential rate. The work to build a more affordable, caring, and safer city where everyone belongs starts today. Events and job opportunities in Regent Park Community, TCHC and Tridel invites you to a Regent Park Community Update Meeting happening on February 29th from 6 to 8 p.m. at the Regent Park Community Center, 402 Shooter Street. You will hear updates from Regent Park Phases 1 to 5, upcoming buildings, community engagement, jobs and training, and relocation and return. Child care and dinner will be provided. Regent Park Cafe now open. Operational hours Monday to Friday from 9 a.m. to 8 p.m at 585 Dundas Street East, Daniel Spectrum. Open for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Join the Regent Park Cafe and support local entrepreneurs. Dixon Hall and Daniel Spectrum presents the Multilingual Community Resource Hub. Starting February 7th, 2024, every Wednesday from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. at Daniel Spectrum Building. There will be assistance with resumes and cover letters, applications, assistance, oral translations, information and referrals for Canadian health care systems, housing and government aids. Mental Health Matters presents free The Sisterhood Self-Defense. Learn about self-defense, mental health, financial literacy and sexual education. Starting March 1st, 2024, every Friday until June 14th from 6 to 7.30 p.m. at 259 Jarvis Street, Regent Park Tech Lending Library is providing Regent Park residents access to laptops, tablets, and fast internet. Open seven days a week from 1 to 7 p.m. at Daniel Spectrum, 585 Dundas Street East. Please bring ID and proof of address. For more information, contact rpna.techlibrary at gmail.com. TCHC and Tridel are calling all small business owners in Regent Park. Are you a Regent Park resident with a small business? Do you offer catering, photography, create handmade goods or other goods and services? Join their small business directory and get connected to business opportunities in the community. If you have questions, email csr at tridel.com. And that's all for today's show. My name is Gabriel Meissner and my co-hosts are Kidar and Fred. We also like to thank our team of researchers that contributed to this week's show and from our studios at Focus Media Arts Centre. Thanks for watching and see you next week. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Also follow us on social media, and for more information, check out our website.